Daphne. Um, I'm a professor and the new subject lead of architecture at the University of Plymouth. Um, welcome tonight to the ROBA Plymouth Branch and University of Plymouth annual lecture by Peter Clegg from Field and Clegg Bradley, FCB studio. And welcome, Peter. I'm sorry we were unable to meet in person to host this event on campus as we usually would but I do hope you and your family are keeping well. Having lived in the UK since 2005, I've had first-hand experience of the positive effect FCB Studio has had on the built environment. First, through my teaching of master's students who had worked for the practice and who carry with them to this day a genuine environmental conscience. But second, as a user of FCB buildings in my everyday life. Pegasus Theatre was somewhere I took my son for weekly classes for many years, but there are many other inspiring FCB buildings that have touched me as a user and architect and an academic. The, op the opportunity to have Peter speak to us tonight to share his knowledge and experiences of building a sustainable earth is a real privilege. And I thank the Reba and all involved in making the talk happen. I'd like to welcome and introduce first Matt Parks, the ROBA Plymouth Chair, who'll say a few words about the Future Plymouth 2030 webinar series, followed by Paul Barnard from the Plymouth City Council. I also want to let you know that this event is being recorded, so please do add any questions to the chat. And finally, I do hope you enjoy the talk and I look forward to, I hope, meeting in person on campus sometime in the near future. Thank you very much. Uh, slide one, please, Richard. Uh, welcome everybody. Thank you for being with us this evening um, for this annual lecture event with Peter Clegg. Uh, many thanks Peter for being with us this evening. Uh, it's very much appreciated uh, your time. Uh, next slide please. So uh, this event is being held uh, as the launch event of the Future Plymouth 2030 webinar series um, that will be taking place over the coming six months uh, covering a wide range of subject matter as listed on screen now, uh, all of which we believe are key in addressing the challenges that Plymouth will face uh, moving forward. Um, we have a, a wide range of speakers lined up um, and more speakers joining uh, the list uh, every day. Um, so um, please do sign up to join us for these events. Um, we very much welcome your attendance and contribution. Uh, next slide, please. So I'd just like to say thank you on behalf of the ROBA to all of our co-sponsors here um, and to our ROBA support team behind the scenes um, delivering today. And I wish to say a special thank you to Sarah Lee, who was the past chair of the Plymouth branch of the ROBA, who has been instrumental in pulling together this entire series. Um, so thank you, everybody. Uh, we really appreciate all of your efforts. Um, so finally, last slide, please. So for, for more information, uh, please visit the web link on screen. Um, and I would now like to welcome Paul Barnard from Plymouth City Council, uh, who will move us forward. Many thanks. Thank you. Um, it's a really great pleasure to be able to uh, introduce this uh, important series um, in raising awareness around climate emergency issues. So I'm going to touch upon um, some of the background to climate emergency work, um, but with, in a way that doesn't steal my own thunder as I'll be one of the speakers uh, at a future event. Um, but uh, really just to say that it's absolutely crucial that this issue uh, is debated and that we share um, uh, ideas, exchange ideas, uh, hear about the challenges that we're facing and also uh, so that we can identify good practice. It's really crucial that 
uh, we do that um, and we uh, experience what uh, what the challenges are in driving forward this sort of this sort of agenda. So it's a real pleasure to be able to introduce this this important series. In terms of um, sort of the situation in Plymouth, um, Plymouth is in fact as a city council one of uh, now 74 percent of councils across the country that have, de uh, have declared a climate emergency. We declared ours on the uh, 18th of March uh, 2019. Most of those councils have uh, recognised the need to accelerate activity uh, in this area, um, given the existential questions that this faces for society. Uh, and so most have set a target date of 2030, although of course our government still is committed to uh, zero carbon by 2050. So there's a clear difference of policy perspective um, at the national and local level on these matters. So we as a council uh, subsequently uh, in December of last year, uh, agreed two action plans. One is a corporate carbon reduction plan reflecting uh, the fact that uh, as a city council we clearly have our own emissions even though they only amount to one percent of the total emissions uh, in the city as a whole but nevertheless we need to take uh, a different approach to how we are delivering our uh, significant range of services. Uh, so we have a corporate carbon reduction plan but we also have a climate emergency action plan and that's sort of set out in three phases recognizing the uh, ratcheting up as I like to call it um, of the actions that we need to take through to 2030. This incidentally is, is on the city council's um, website so our first climate emergency action plan um, uh, is already in the process of being implemented and it's around uh, it's structured around um, key uh, areas of, of, of decarbonisation around energy, power and heat, mobility and transport, buildings, waste and crucially uh, engagement and responsibility, behavioural change initiatives associated with the whole climate change uh, debate. So the first climate emergency action plan, which was deliberately identified as the first of 11 plans, clearly 11 plans through to 2030, contains 75 specific actions. 85% uh, of those are already underway and 11% of them have already been, complete, uh, been completed. Clearly, uh, along came a public health uh, emergency. Uh, which clearly has made delivery of that agenda difficult, but has also perhaps highlighted different ways in which services can be delivered and indeed uh, how behaviours are changing, whether that's in relation to retailing, transport or other matters. So uh, we've developed what we call the Resurgent Programme, uh, which is our recovery programme um, to deal with the uh, uh, challenges of the pandemic in, in all its various guises. But as we move towards uh, recovering and bringing forward more sustainable green jobs and a green economy. And again, uh, future items on the uh, on the web on the program uh, and the series uh, will pick up on some of those issues. So, just to give you a very quick flavour of some of the the highlights, um, we're working on on a creating a renewable ground source uh, heat pump system in uh, Mill Bay as part of the Mill Bay Boulevard. For those of you who follow these maps. Uh, the architect David Mackey in his vision for Plymouth back in 2003. Um, so we're doing some work around that in relation to our regeneration plans in Mill Bay. Uh, we've already implemented a number of passive house and zero carbon housing schemes uh, in the city uh, through our plan for homes uh, and we're looking to bring forward a flagship zero carbon development work for the Plymouth energy community. Our low carbon team has secured um, grants of 3.3 million from the Green Homes Grant to improve the energy efficiency of existing buildings targeted towards the fuel poor uh, and uh, improving um, uh, the insulation of those homes. And uh, we've also got a significant program uh, of uh, uh, installing electric charging uh, infrastructure, a program that in total adds up to 503 uh, EV chargers being installed around the city. Um, 62 of those have already been installed and there's a program uh, that is rolling forward on, on that. And that is linked to uh, the City Council's Transforming Cities Fund uh, bid, which is a £96 million program 
comprising 16 schemes and 29 projects, which is all about um, more sustainable uh, travel patterns, uh, encouraging um, different ways in which people will travel, encouraging walking and cycling projects, uh, the flagship of which is the creation of a 30 to 50 multimodal uh, mobility hubs across the city, uh, where there will be electric charging points, uh, um, 400 electric bikes, uh, establishment of electric car clubs, uh, and linking that to some of the key areas of footfall within the city. So we're currently looking at where all of those will be um, set out around the city, as well as, as I said, um, uh, cycling and walking projects um, around uh, both it principally in the in the northern corridor of the city, where a lot of growth is planned, and the eastern corridors of the city, where equally uh, there's a significant amount of growth planned. So for me, um, this, this series is, is really, really important. I don't want to steal the thunder of my colleagues who are going to come and speak, but uh, let me just signpost a couple uh, of those to you. So my um, colleague, Holly Golden, who is the head of um, procurement in the city, will be talking about high social value procurement in the construction sector. The Resurgen program is, is key to that in terms of getting those local sustainable jobs and how we can um, uh, spend funding uh, in uh, with local commu local uh, communities and local businesses uh, to, uh, to, Im to improve the economy of the city. Um, my colleague uh, John Green will be talking about the Mobility Hub project in more detail so you can hear more about uh, what those plans are uh, in, uh, in terms of where those what that project comprises. Uh, we'll, my uh, Plymouth Energy community will be talking about green homes and the opportunities that they're looking to bring forward as, as our local energy company. Uh, they're looking to step, step into the space of delivering uh, zero carbon homes. Uh, and uh, so they'll be talking about that. And as some of you may know, uh, we have recently uh, changed our city change fund, uh, which is funding from the community infrastructure levy. Uh, to uh, using the crowdfunder platform to support local um, uh, projects. We have recently uh, changed the criteria for that so that um, uh, projects that are community based projects um, with green ideas, climate emergency interventions and projects can be supported up to £45,000. So there's a current uh, um, uh, uh, challenge going on, a climate emergency challenge. Uh, which is uh, is is being organised by Crowdfunder and the City Council to bring forward. I think we've shortlisted 12 projects which are currently developing their ideas um, for the future. So uh, I hope that gives you a flavour of the work that we're doing. I'll be saying a bit more myself about the climate emergency action plan work uh, that we're doing uh, and uh, you'll hear from other colleagues and indeed other speakers. But to reiterate, this program is really important because we need to hear from other voices, hear what the challenges are, and for that to inform the future plans. I said that uh, the Climate Emergency Action Plan is one of 11. Uh, it's important that those projects uh, 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 have a continued focus on delivery if we're going to meet that challenge of Plymouth becoming net zero by 2030. So thank you. Thank you, Ajir Batten Paul. My name is Andy Humphreys, and I'm the BA Programme Leader uh, for Architecture here at the University of Plymouth. And could we just go on to the next slide, please? Can we have the next slide? Thank you. And before we move on to the main event and I introduce our guest speaker, I'd just like to say. In terms of what we've been just talking about just now, there are key things in relation to what's happening at the university that can reach out and inform uh, what becomes, should we say, practice of excellence through the, the Sustainable Earth Institute, which brings researchers, businesses and community together in a collaborative environment to really understand how projects can have an impact towards a sustainable earth. And the next slide, please. And alongside that, um, within the Sustainability Hub, the Low Carbon Devon Project, which is in a sense supporting the region and is completely aligned to the RIBA 2030 climate challenge. But alongside that, with work that we're going to be doing in the studio in semester two, align students, so academia and industry, 
together with the Future Plymouth 2030 series. So I think this is really exciting time to head and a great platform for this lecture to start that whole process off with. So it gives me great pleasure to introduce the RIBA Plymouth and University of Plymouth annual lecture 2020 Beyond the Declaration by Peter Clegg. Peter, thank you. Great, thank you very much indeed. Thank you for that introduction uh, and particularly thank you to Paul for describing all the uh, amazing initiatives that are going on in the city. Um, it's, it's always struck me as being really interesting to find that actually I think we're beginning, cities are beginning to tackle the real issues of climate change better than countries are. Uh, it's just, uh, I think there's, there's a degree of emergency local, locally that people feel. Uh, I'm going to share my screen uh, if I can do this. Uh, hold on. I'm hoping that you can see that. Let me know if you can't. And I'm hoping that uh, you can see it full screen now. Is that OK? Can someone just tell me that that's what they've come to listen to? Hi, the screen's. OK, shall I continue? We can't see the, uh, the, the, the slides at the moment, Peter. Ah. OK, well, um, let me think what. Um, so we go back again. Yeah, they're com coming out as just uh, dark in the dark at the minute. Hmm. Um. No. Stop sharing screens and maybe should do that. Is there any way you could? Uh, I mean, right. Are we back? Can you see me now? Yes. Yeah. And you can hear me. Open share. You see that? Do I have to get be given control? Yes, that's come up, Peter. That's come up, has it? Yeah, we have see? biodiversity, climate, COVID-19. Yeah, fine, we're OK then. OK, um, let me know if there's any problems. So otherwise I'll kind of launch in. I, I just a couple of caveats and sort of apologies to start with. I hope uh, I'm going to talk about depressing subjects. You know, I'm going to talk about crises. Uh, I'm going to talk quite technically, and I apologize if I'm going to be talking too technically, but I think it's important that as architects we understand uh, something of the, the uh, importance of the technical issues around carbon. Um, and I'm going to try and keep to 45 minutes, uh, but I've got quite a lot of slides to get through. I will start with the technical side and then we'll get into, I'm going to show you four projects uh, to, uh, uh, about a quarter of an hour into the talk. OK, so um, I've been in practice for about 40 years. Uh, we've always had a strong uh, environmental and social agenda to our work. Um, and we've been very privileged doing lots of really interesting work for the building research establishment, for the National Trust headquarters, Woodland Trust headquarters, etc. Lots of buildings which we thought were actually pushing the boundaries of low carbon design. Um, but we've discovered, certainly in the last few years, that we're just kind of nowhere near where we need to be uh, in order to drive the carbon agenda down within the construction industry. Um, and I think the changes that have happened, really, that have led us to that thinking, firstly, a couple of years ago, there was the UN report on biodiversity telling us that we're actually destroying 
more species than had happened in, um, way back since the dinosaurs. You know, we are in effectively the sixth level of extinction over 450 million years. Very, very depressing stuff on biodiversity. And of course, a couple of years ago also, we had the IPCC report into global warming, really saying we had 12 years left uh, in order to turn things around before we went into a kind of spiral of uh, global heating. So what's happened? Well, I mean, I think uh, this girl was a fantastic uh, uh, impetus for us all to take to the streets in in um, uh, September 20, uh, 2019. Um, and we've also got people like this guy who actually was, if you haven't seen this on Netflix, it's a really significant issue. So it's a really significant program which head, which deals head on with, with the, the, the loss of biodiversity. Not that, in fact, it's in some, some ways quite kind of heartening the changes that are happening. And this is this is an image of Chernobyl here, that what happens when we leave the man-made environment and the natural environment takes over. Uh, there's resilience in nature that uh, is in, very important for us to recognise. But if you look at what's been happening over the um, Anthropocene era, particularly since 1950, um, these are global carbon emissions rising at extraordinary rates. If you look at the bottom three, two or three of those graphs, you can see um, your European Union, Europe, United States beginning, carbon emissions beginning to slow down. But of course, that's partly because we're just buying in high carbon products from China and, and, and the Asian Pacific. But this is what we've got to do by 2050 in order to meet the targets of COP21. And as you know, I'm sure building related emissions are for nearly 40% of all global CO2 emissions and embodied carbon represents 11% of those emissions. Interestingly, over my uh, lifetime of practice, I don't go back to 1961, but the, the, um, there's been a huge change in the understanding of how we use carbon. It used to be the, the, the gray area was the embodied, the, the, the operational emissions, the, the emissions, the carbon emissions that it result from day-to-day -day use of our buildings were the bulk of what we had to deal with. And the blue areas there that was the smaller segment in the 1960s and 70s uh, were the embodied carbon emissions. Now, because we're producing a lot more uh, low carbon electricity and we have uh, uh, higher standards of insulation, etc. It's the embodied carbon emissions that are taking over and that for the next 10, 10 years or so, need, we, that's where we need to focus our attention. We need to produce, yes, very low carbon uh, operational buildings, but it, we need to figure out how to build buildings using lower embodied carbon. And look at where we were in 2017-18. These, uh, this is the base report on, you, uh, you know, how we're meeting our UK gas, greenhouse gas emissions targets. And you see we're doing pretty well in terms of taking the carbon out of the power. power. Industry's doing surprisingly well, transport reasonably well. And look at buildings at the other end, increasing emissions, increasing emissions that are going into servicing buildings and constructing buildings. So two years ago, uh, just about the same time as Plymouth was signing up to its uh, its carbon declaration, we got together with 17 founder members, sterling prize winners of the uh, of the industry, and we produced a declaration. And since then, we've had a thousand plus signatory practices in the UK, and we've had 6,000 globally uh, in 23 countries across the world. We've set up a wider a construction declares steering group that, that then brings together the landscape architects, engineers, project delivery people and the, and the architects. And we've also set up regionally focused uh, um, groups that are form part, form part of the construction declares umbrella, if you like. Um, and I'm not going to go through the, the declaration in detail, just want to raise a few um, point to a few things. One is just the, the, the first and foremost thing that we constantly need to do with our clients and contractors is raise awareness of the climate, climate and biodiversity emergencies. Um, 
We need to share knowledge better, research and performance, working with the um, research-based industries such as you have at the University of Plymouth and share that data on an open source basis. Most importantly, we need to look at upgrading our existing buildings for extended reuse. Um, and we need to shift to low embodied carbon materials in our work. And in a way, a, across the board, adopt more regenerative design principles. That is kind of going beyond zero carbon. That is remediation of land, increasing biodiversity and producing buildings that are in effect are either sequestering carbon in their construction or, car or net carbon, net in energy exporters because you're producing too much energy within, within your building. So the idea is that we are producing, we should be producing a transport, a, a transformed built environment planned and constructed and operating within planetary boundaries but also delivering positive and social impacts for all. There's an idea of social equity that's based in the declaration as well. So people have already mentioned the RIBA 2030 climate challenge. I hope you've signed up for it. It is, uh, it has changed the way we practice and it's changed, it's now becoming used by our client base, which is really interesting. So it's as a series of metrics that are, that are way more useful than BRIAM and LEED and building regulations, which is way behind the curve. So congratulations to the RABA for producing this. This is for their targets for domestic buildings, operational energy, embodied energy, and water use, and for uh, non-domestic buildings. A little bit more work to be done for other building typologies, but it's great to have those new targets to work to. And if you haven't yet found it, uh, look up the Letty guides, particularly your students. It's a very easy, um, uh, understandable set of guidelines for designing within the climate emergency and also looking at the embodied uh, energy, uh, embodied carbon in, in, in our buildings. Tells you how to plan a route through to 2030. Looks at total UK greenhouse gas emissions and there again you can see that um, you know within the business and domestic sector we've got 20% from heating and hot water and as well as the uh, uh, other ways of uh, other energy that goes into the buildings in terms of powering them. I, I, I'm, th I'm showing the, a few slides from the Letty guide because I just want you if you're a student in particular but also if you're practicing architects, just to get used to it. It's a really, really good set of guidelines to follow from the outset of uh, when you start designing buildings. It reminds you that um, this is a graph of a 60 year life of a building, of the amount of energy that might go, the embodied energy in pink there that goes into the completion of a building and the operational carbon that goes into servicing it over the 60 year life. And remember that there are cycles of replacement and maintenance that go into adding embodied carbon and then there's the end of life demolition as well that we need to take into account and when you're looking at a a, a, a typical building regulations compliant building um, you're looking at um, the bulk of the energy this is in a let's say a residential building a house the bulk of that energy goes into heating a house when you're looking at a super low energy building we're tightening up the insulation dramatically, and actually it's the other energy uses, it's the power and the uh, ventilation and fans, et cetera, that actually are the bulk of the energy that goes into it. Uh, Letty also gives you instant kind of ways in which you can go from current practice on the left-hand side to alert to low energy practice on the right. The kind of easy wins, if you like, in order to kind of really cut down the, uh, the energy consumption of a building. And again, the Letty has its own targets for embodied energy, domestic and non-domestic, um, that pretty much parallel the RIBA 2030 targets. And again, looking at going from these, the larger circles being building regs compliant through to ultra low energy buildings. And the way you can see that the embodied energy, which is in the, the pink color, becomes more significant as you tighten up the um, the energy use, the operational energy use of the building. And finally, after the Letty guide, I just uh, I just threw this one in because it's actually 
it just tells you instantly where the savings are to be made uh, in embodied carbon. Most of the uh, embodied energy that goes into our new buildings goes into floors, foundations, envelopes, and envelope frame and piling. You can sort of, if you get those right, and if you really focus on them, all the other things that go into finishing the building are much, much less significant. So one of the things beyond going back to beyond the declaration, one of the things that we've been doing is looking very hard at the um, way we assess the carbon emissions from our buildings. And we produce our own kind of carbon tool. It's a very simple, very uh, easy to use um, carbon assessment pro uh, pro program for early stages in a project. So, and again, um, this is too many figures here, so I'm just gonna tell you roughly what it does. It takes the operational carbon and measures the operational carbon as, uh, either from typical values of electrical, non-electric and total energy. Um, and it takes, looks at the embodied in carbon and calculates that from a series of parameters, including building perimeter, footprint, building width, etc. So very early on, you can get an assessment of the embodied carbon and the operational carbon. If you uh, want to look at it in more detail and you go to specific materials and, 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 and measure and calculate those, if you want to know where to go for carbon data, the best place is the ICE database in the University of Bath or uh, energy, energy performance certificates, environmental product declarations, sorry, that actually you can gain from any manufacturer, reputable manufacturer on the, on the products that they produce. So the outputs of our carbon tool are, uh, are these. There's, a, there's four separate little charts. One top left dealing with operational energy, top right dealing with embodied carbon, then the whole life carbon, that's looking at the sequence of carbon throughout the 60 year or so life of the building. And then we also looked at the amount of offsets that you would need if you fail to meet the zero carbon targets. And just looking at those in a little bit more detail, again, we're looking at the top bar there you see is comparing it with the uh, RIBA 2030 challenge targets uh, from uh, 2020 on the right hand side to 2030 on the left. And this is just looking at a notional set of figures and, and it automatically gives you an, the, the, the bar, the black bar across the top tells you where you are in that range of targets. If you want to look at embodied carbon, it tells you again along the top line from 2020 to 2030, where you are in terms of the embodied carbon targets. And then we look at whole life carbon as it builds up over the 60 year life of the 100 year life of the building. And we look at the, the necessary sequestered energy, either in terms of, uh, well, we've typically measured it in terms of uh, hectares of forest that you would need to sequester whatever carbon you were still giving off from your building or estate improvement, which is we've taken this from the uh, Camden uh, have a really interesting uh, Camden Borough in London have a really interesting uh, sort of tax system whereby they actually um, uh, take payments from the uh, from the planning uh, permit permission data per permissions that they regard they, they give out and they actually are improving their estate. They're reducing the carbon in their estate. I think Paul was talking about something similar that Plymouth is doing as well. So just to show you an example of how we're using that tool, this is a building that we designed about 10 years ago. Uh, that's the little icon that you can see on the top left hand corner, it's the shape of the building. It's a building that spirals round and ends up in a little kind of courtyard in the middle. It's the headquarters of, a built, of an organization called the Woodland Trust. And they're based in Grantham. Very simple, 15 meter deep plan floor plate building, entirely constructed out of timber. So the whole thing is cross laminated timber construction, walls, floors and roof. One row of steel columns that you can see down the middle of the building. And the whole building is clad on the outside of the cross laminated timber in wood wool insulation and battens and counter battens and Siberian larch. So that's the building. And this is how um, we did some, um, we, we've got quite a lot of data on this building, so we're able to fill in the data. And this is the sort of base model. And you can see 
in the uh, in the operational energy here, we're way way the electrical energy is way off the graph because uh, there is a major server in the building. Um, so normally it would be back down here, but we're the the uh, electrical energy means that we are we don't meet anything like the RBA uh, 2030 challenge. The embodied carbon, however, is extremely good. Uh, we've, there's a huge amount of sequestered carbon in the timber, and we, we are easily meeting the 2030 challenge. Uh, but that, this is the operational energy that's kind of continuously rising and getting worse over the years as, we, as this building uses lots of electrical energy. And of course, uh, uh, we, we're nowhere near me meeting zero carbon targets. We just did a little bit of exercise here. So if we, if we took out the server energy, then we are kind of halfway. This is 2020 and this is 2030 in terms of the RIBA climate challenge. So we're kind of getting there. We're 2023 or something uh, because our electrical energy is, is, is shot down. And the embodied carbon is pretty low. And you can see this makes a huge difference. It's just the amount of energy that goes into keeping the server, the major server for the whole of the Woodland Trust database for the, for the UK going. But we then looked at what happens if we did what we call a green retrofit. Now, the, the green retrofit here was planned for the building. The building, as you as you saw in those, from those initial images, had a, an, a, a very substantial 30 degree south facing roof that was designed to take photovoltaics. And if you put, um, if you did cloud the thing with photovoltaics, it's ready to go, um, and you put an air source heat pump in, we're getting even further down to, uh, up towards the, the 2030 targets. Um, and we're getting the, the operational energy is way, way down. So this is just an indication of how you can use this tool to actually uh, test buildings very quickly, very easily. This is about half a day's work to get this data out. So um, this is on our website. If you want to download it, you can. You can play with it. It's a very preliminary bit of um, software. If, let us know if you find any bugs with it. Uh, it's just something that we have developed as a result of the, really as a result of the increased awareness that's brought about by the declaration and the, and the climate emergency. So I'd just like to show you very quickly then four um, projects. Um, two of which are completed and um, really carry some of the messaging from maybe this one is uh, 10 years ago in terms of our low energy approach to low energy design. And two of them are um, on our, uh, uh, I was going to say our drawing boards because people don't have drawing boards anymore, but uh, they, are, they are going through the design process at the moment. Um, so this project uh, in Worcester is called The Hive, which is a library for the city and the University of Worcester. It was, we won a competition, uh, it's a developer-led competition, so we were um, employed by Gallifer Tri on design build basis to work for the a consortium of the city and the university to create a new library and archive for the city and a library for the university. And this is where it sits. Uh, this is a new building uh, that you can see here. I'm hoping my cursor works. Um, and this is all university territory here on this side of a railway viaduct. And the main city centre is up here. The cathedral is up here. And the, the, the River Severn is only half uh, 500 metres away. Um, so one of the first things we did was uh, uh, with our engineers think, well, actually, the river's there. We may as well take heat out of it very easily. So it's become part of the uh, heat and cooling system for the building uh, along with the biomass boiler. The initial drawing which uh, produced this design uh, was took as its starting point the idea that we create a new um, it's a series of buildings we were asked to because we, we were we were asked to only build on part of the site, which is the this area here, um, which is to the um, southeast of the site, leaving other sites available to uh, for future development to create both retail or housing development around a new urban square. So we're creating not only a building, but a little bit of the city here. And there's a pedestrian route that then leads through under that 
railway viaduct to the university and back to the city. At the same time as we were conceiving the, the sort of formal layout, we were working with our engineers, Max Fordham, with whom we've done most of the significant low energy projects uh, over the last 40 years. Uh, thinking about uh, learning from previous projects, National Trust headquarters, that Woodland Trust building we both did with Fordham's. And we know uh, that we, we knew there that we could create a deep plan building, naturally ventilated. We knew how to make the natural ventilation systems work. We knew that we would have to bring air into the center of the building. And so there's an, uh, a substantial two meter square duct that goes under the building and pops up in the center and provides natural ventilation to the middle of the building at, at the same time as we can use uh, the perimeter to also provide uh, fresh air. And we can um, we then de design the pyramidal roof structure uh, with um, uh, ventilators that are wind assisted and, and guaranteed to produce negative air pressure through the building. So they, they, you don't get any blowback from the wind. Um, while Fordham's were doing drawings like that, we modeled it. Uh, this is a very, very early BIM model that we did ages ago, um, but it's kind of interesting. It shows you, you know, that we can an annotate it with these arrows going all over the place. There's too many of them, but um, showing you how the pyramidal roof structures work over the major spaces within the building and the central atrium space and provide a constant but really well regulated airflow through the building. And the three dimensional modeling of the building with its seven pyramids, it sits on the river and looks across to the seven hills of the Malvern range. Um, and it has a kind of um, uh, an intriguing roof form that breaks very, very large deep plan building down into a series of uh, a, a finer grain. We then worked with um, both uh, structure engineers, uh, Atelier One and service engineers Fordham's to, to to define the complex geometry of these uh, roof forms with a parametric model that we designed ourselves that we then could actually pass on to the um, the people who ended up design, uh, producing the structure, the structural elements for this building um, out of cross laminated timber. So interestingly, because this was a design and build job, um, we were told by our contractors, Gallifer Tri, that they wanted to build it in steel and concrete. Uh, we said all along, well, actually, it makes a lot of sense to create these roof forms out of timber, uh, not because necessarily it'll sequester energy, but it'll just be cheaper and quicker for you to build. And eventually they said, OK, we'll prove it to us. And so we were able with this parametric modeling to show how we could define the geometries passed that on to a cross laminated timber manufacturer and they were able to then say yes we can do this this and this and we can design this so that it can go together just like a kind of very cleverly designed sort of flat pack system um, and so the the pyramids that you're seeing there are all made out of cross laminated timber um, this at the same time we were doing uh, a different kinds of modeling to look at the Airflow, uh, the, the top model there is a Perspex model that we put in a wind tunnel at Cardiff University so that we can we, sh we, we can define the, um, we, we can ensure that these, that one turret, one roof turret doesn't impinge on the natural ventilation of the other. Um, and we also designed this, uh, I have to say it was a very clever system, I think, but a system whereby the wind is going across here constantly drawing air out of the building irrespective of the wind direction. Um, so there's a very, um, there's a, a damper here that is easily sealed but, and very, very finely tuned, controlled, but we can constantly um, guarantee that there's an airflow through the building and negative airflow through the building without any blowback. So what it looks like when you start putting it all together is this. We ended up with a cross laminated timber um, grid shell across the um, 
the tops of the turrets of these built of, of each pyramid so that these are providing shade to direct sunlight. These are the kind of mega 30 meter long for three and a half meter wide panels that form the sides of each pyramid. Um, they did about one a week just with hoisting them into place and they fit incredibly snugly. And there is to form the inside layer, the insulation and the outside layer. So this is the main central space. With the CLT exposed, both in terms of the grid, you can see that it's doing, it's diffusing the sunlight there and the and this is the internal surface of the panels that is also cross laminated timber. And while they were at it, they made all these stairs out of CLT and the balustrades out of CLT. So the whole thing becomes uh, um, the, the, the sequestered carbon that goes into this went into this building was equivalent to about 10 years worth of the operational emissions. So it's a huge change going from steel and concrete to timber. That's it uh, as completed. Um, working with the uh, landscape designers, uh, Grant Associates, they produced a, an inverted version of our pyramid here as a sort of uh, attenuation pond. And this is where the air intake is that goes into the centre of the building to help with the natural ventilation. So that's it. Uh, very glowing copper facade, which is now, thank God, dulled down a bit. I was a little bit, I, was, I, I never quite liked it being too shiny, but our clients loved it. It was, uh, we talked about the, cop, the, the color, the gold being part of the history of the Worcester porcelain industry, which is gold and blue. Um, and it's a, it's a gold patinated copper, not real gold, but it's, uh, a, a, it's a patination on copper. Interestingly, itself a very low energy building because it's now 90% recycled um, and relatively easy to recycle. So that's one of the things that's come into, uh, that we're really concerned with now is finding out the recycling pathways of building materials that we're working with. And here you can see the bridge that leads back from you walking across from the city centre and you can go through the arches at the other side to the university. Our copper bridge and the interior which is very uh, light stained, uh, very Scandinavian timber finish. And um, we then just looked here at uh, the design targets that we had to meet and the measured use and um, we we did uh, two, um, two, we had two goes at, uh, at looking at the post occupancy evaluation of this, and this is, I think, the second time we looked at it. Yeah. Um, uh, total water use just a little bit more than we uh, anticipated, um, uh, which I think is to do with the fact that this is an 18 hour use building and we were anticipating less than that. Um, the biomass heating um, was a little bit uh, less needed than we anticipated. Fossil fuel use, which is the kind of backup to the biomass boiler, was very, very low. And the electrical use, uh, in the end, we fine tuned it down to about half of what we imagined. So a lot of this was, a lot of these, the savings in electrical energy were made during the second period, post occupation ev evaluation period. So it's really important to keep going back to your buildings, understanding how they use energy, etc. So that's that. Thing. I just wanted to um, show you very quickly and uh, the, 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 a building that looks at low carbon from a different perspective. It's a project that we've been working on for about 10 years. It's the South Bank Centre in London. So huge high embodied energy in terms of concrete, but beautiful concrete. And we were the only people that said uh, out of the six uh, international competitors that said, we think you should keep this building. It's a worthy expression of 1960s brutalist concrete. People might not like it, very unfashionable building, but it's a fabulous gutsy building. This is what it looks like. It looked like when we first started working on it. Uh, uh, extraordinary, slightly sort of tired looking building, um, but we wanted to give it a new life and we did a lot of work looking at it um, from a, how you would do more radical work, radical improvements to it. Um, it has a, on the right hand side, um, 
the Hayward Gallery, the rectilinear spaces. On the left hand side, the Queen Elizabeth Hall and the little recital room. And then down to the, from the, to the south of the Queen Elizabeth Hall, the, this large non orthogonal foyer space. Um, extraordinary 60s images of it opening to um, uh, applause as well as absolute uh, venom and hatred by uh, the Daily Mail readers, etc. And then eventually, over the years, it has been, uh, you know, um, uh, Jude Kelly, who ran it for many years, started gardening the roof and creating play areas on the terraces. Sculptures abound and expand from it, and the terraces, one artist flooded them. You know, it becomes a kind of hive of activity. It's an amazing backdrop to build with. And this was the concept model that we put together that I think won us the scheme. It was a cast concrete model, and it has two elements of it on it, which we felt we, where we could add space as well as as well as refurbishing the existing buildings. We can add a little a linear building at the back facing Waterloo Bridge Road and a new atrium that joined the Hayward and the Queen Elizabeth Hall. And uh, further modelling that we did to explore that much larger scheme. Now, in the end, uh, for all kinds of reasons, this larger scheme didn't go ahead and we ended up doing a refurbishment, which I think will be a phase one of uh, there will be other things that happen on this site because it certainly can take more development. This is the CGI that we produced. Um, uh, and one of the things that we did was to start looking at the Hayward roof lights, which are these pyramidal roof lights, which are part of the iconography of the building, but they leaked and let in too much light and caused problems for the whole of the 40 years of their existence. This is what we found when we got there. So what they were like in the 60s, you know, sort of bit of out of Bond movie or Barbarella or something, you know, they say, uh, and they have this uh, strangely designed and quite dominant um, lay lights at low level and with this uh, zone in between the two. Uh, so what we did was uh, created a new set of, um, uh, if you like, uh, tubes that connect the roof light to the ceiling below. Um, and instead of the, and, and there's very complex buildup from the, um, the tubes that you can see as the first layer, and then a layer of structure that takes what effectively is a kind of series of very, very shallow roof lights, but we retain the pyramids, the pyramid, pyramidal structures just become shading. So it's a lot cheaper and easier and guaranteed no leakage if we build shallow, shallow roof lights, the second layer down, rather than trying to create very complex way these these new pyramids. So this is what we're, we're looking at it from the inside. And what you're looking at there from e through each tube is a the, the pyramid has got two uh, two sides of a white uh, fretted glass, which is shading, providing most of the shading of the uh, uh, onto the roof light. And the glass layer is virtually flat, so um, very easy. You don't see any of the gla glazing framework and you just look up and you see um, these, the, the, these pyramids from below. And this is what they look like from the outside looking over, the, over towards the pink lighting of the National Theatre. So you can see there that the pyramids are, they're there, they're doing a function, they're shading the roof light. And they're keeping the iconography of the of the uh, of, of the glazing, um, but the 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 actual glazing itself is almost flat, and that's what the new gallery looks like. A lot simpler, easier, but really good, high quality, controllable natural light. And downstairs below, we just kind of lovingly restored all of this concrete and uh, did what we needed to do to actually sort out the lighting loads, replacing them with LEDs, etc., saving large, large amounts of energy. And then in the adjacent um, 
Queen Elizabeth Hall. This was what it was like in the 1970s, very uncluttered and beautiful space. But over the years, it had become, it had, it had become, they'd made a much larger stage. They put a lot of uh, stage lighting and, and theatrical stuff around it and it became very cluttered. And we sort of returned it to its it, more of its pristine quality. Still, we still need all that technical insulation to make it work. Uh, but we took the timber work of the uh, the uh, resonators on each side and took that into the stage and made a new timber stage as well. So it's in, uh, it's remaking the the link between stage and audience. Um, and the rest of it was just a beautiful refurbishment job. So again, you know, more and more uh, talking to the students that, that, that I hope are listening, your role is going to be in refurbishment of buildings rather than new buildings. And you've got to learn to love it. And it is fabulous. It's great, particularly dealing with buildings like this. And the challenge is uh, of, of uh, dealing, of, of reducing energy consumption dramatically. So again, looking at what this foyer was like in the 70s, fabulous uncluttered space that have then deteriorated over the years. And this is what we this is what it looks like now. We had we've replaced these extraordinary triangular um, lighting and uh, acoustical insulation devices in the ceiling, adding much more acoustical insulation. Um, We've uh, redone the furnishing and the decoration completely, brought it, cleaned up the concrete and brought it back to its uh, getting back towards its uh, the initial intention of the 1970s building. Um, and a layer of new um, fit out that obviously the fit out has a shorter life and that's fine. And some of it I wasn't too keen on actually, but um, it, it's a uh, I think one has to think about a building where there, there is huge embodied energy in the materials of the structure, as we're looking at here, that is really valuable to maintain. And there is, uh, when one comes to detail fit out and furnishings, etc., it's a question of figuring out how those can be recycled, maybe after 10 years of life. So we had a lot of fun designing those light roof lights, etc. Interestingly, the, um, if you look at the, this is the model we worked with, the BIM model of the Haywood and the, and the um, Queen Elizabeth Hall. And if you look at everything that you see on the outside, everything blue there is plant and equipment and it's, the, it's ducts and plant rooms, etc. It's kind of interesting that the building was almost celebrating the, it, its duct work in a, in a similar way, although a much more concrete and solid way. There's, as the Pompidou Centre uh, 10 years later celebrated ducts on the outside of buildings. Uh, but this obviously, this was designed, as you, some of you may know, by, I mean, two of the people that were responsible for delivering this were Warren Chalk and Ron Heron, who went on to form Archigram. Anyway, so that was fun. That's most of what it's all about, which is all understanding and detailing the servicing systems of the building. Taking things like this out, it's a huge, great fan, and putting new, very, very highly efficient systems in. Keeping these extraordinary um, cast aluminium uh, uh, ventilating snouts, if you like. Uh, but we reversed the flow within the hall here. So these were actually, they, they used to drop cold air onto people. They now um, suck air under. The, the, from diffusing and air that comes in under the seats gets exhausted at high level, thus making it about sort of 20% more efficient. So again, looking at those efficiency savings in the operational energy. And this is um, uh, looking at what we managed to achieve in terms of the Hayward Gallery in orange, the Queen Elizabeth Hall in, in uh, red, and the total in green, looking at the a daily average consumption from what what we uh, from the 2013 before we did anything to 2018 when it was completed and you can see we've virtually halved the Hayward Gallery's energy consumption. We haven't done so well on the Queen Elizabeth Hall, but what we have done there is introduced 
air conditioning which didn't exist before. It did exist, but it never ever worked. And so uh, what we've done is dramatically improved comfort conditions uh, in changing the air conditioning systems. A um, couple more very quickly. How am I doing for time? Ooh, very quickly. Um, oh, Paradise Street, London. I just want to show you this one. It's had a lot of attention in the press recently. It's an interesting site right next to the, the to the uh, trains that go into Waterloo Station. Uh, it's a commercial office building in green there that fits in into a particularly peculiar triangular site. It has uh, elevation facing the railway, and we kind of want well, why not celebrate it? You know, we're going to put in be putting in triple glazing. There's acoustical isolation there, um, so let's just um, open it up to the south and to the railway, um, and also open it up to the other side to this little old paradise park. Um, um, but what makes this building an interesting e exemplar of zero carbon design really is that although it's got um, a glazed terracotta facade, which isn't particularly good from an energy perspective, it is an entirely, again, entirely timber building with this uh, lattice work beam that you can see running around there at first floor level and uh, every floor then being um, cross laminated timber and, and glue lamp posts going up on the inside of the building. So you can sort of see there the um, there are there are some steel beams, secondary steel beams, but they're primarily that we're talking about uh, cross laminated floor plates um, and the big timber structures, big timber posts. Um, site plan in this fits into this very narrow triangular space between park and railway. Um, the ground floor plan largely kind of entrance space and uh, a commercial unit out the front. Second floor, which is a very open and shared space for the whole building and looks out onto the uh, railway. And third to the fifth, which are just similar, si very simple floor plates. Um, all mechanically ventilated with heat recovery, uh, all designed for super flexibility with the, uh, all office spaces being seven meters from a view and from a, a, an opening window, although you don't have to open the windows because the, there is a mech vent system that will take, take care of the building. Um, and there you can see the size of these mega trusses on the outside at level one. This is the, um, the uh, first floor communal space. And so this is how we're looking, this is what we're looking at then in terms of our, with our, uh, 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 outline carbon tool, um, looking operational carbon, which is getting towards uh, pioneering. We're not doing terribly well because we can't here because we can't. We've got very little space to put renewable energy in terms of solar collectors or PVs, etc. But here, this looks at, for instance, the um, this is the, the the embodied energy is way below. Uh, it's minus 148 kilograms. Of CO2 per square meter. So we're way below the 2030 targets, largely because of all the sequestered tim uh, uh, CO2 in the timber. This is the um, upper floors and external walls and the, more than counterbalancing uh, the, uh, the rest of the building. Uh, so the lifetime carbon we do, we, we, we're starting out negative and we end up somewhere around sort of 30, 40 years uh, balancing operational carbon with embodied carbon. In fact, there you are. That's the graph that is the combined operational and embodied carbon impact over the lifetime of the building. So for the first 35, 40 years, um, this is a carbon negative building. And finally, one last project. Uh, interesting that this came in sort of before, before the, the climate crisis and before all our declarations, etc. Uh, it's been a long time in its gestation, but uh, King's College, Cambridge, uh, came to us and said they wanted a super low energy building, but they wanted it to last for 100 years. And we'd never thought of the consequences of that kind of 
decision, you know, and we immediately said, well, it needs a lot of maintenance, or it is going to need maintenance over the 100 year cycle, and it's going to need various elements replacing, but we, we will give you a package of the design of, that will include the maintenance cycles. And so this is it really, it's a, it's a site on a suburban area just outside Cambridge, only 10 minutes cycle ride from King's College. And they wanted a new college community for fellows, family apartments, graduate rooms, shared common room, etc. They were very interested. They came to us and said passive house certification um, and a hundred year design life. Um, there was some existing buildings on the site. Uh, there was one that we decided that we had to retain. The rest were of very poor uh, constructional quality. So we, we have instead looked at ways at ways of recycling the various materials that with, that are embodied within these within these buildings which are, and they had a certain interesting quality when you looked at them but they were really badly designed falling apart and very very low floor to ceiling height so um and we needed to just put a lot more accommodation on site which is actually a, a um of itself is 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 uh, the, increasing the density of our cities is something that we need to kind of look to what it's doing. So this is what Cambridge City Plan has asked us to look at and thinking about they're quite interested in the idea of these retaining the idea of two gables onto the street. Um, that was what we demolished the three uh, 1930s buildings here. We retained uh, this this little villa building and an old barn here and there were some protected trees on the site and we came up quite early on with this idea of creating the gables onto the road but actually opening up the space between them to create this kind of uh, 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 a champagne cork plan really opening it up towards the south um, and closing it down towards the road there's also a space here that is a new building attached to an existing building that the college owns. So the slightly altered perspective uh, leads you in and makes the space feel a little bit bigger and open out. Um, the fellows and graduates rooms we put in two rows of terraced houses with the gables onto the street. Sorry, the, the, that's the fellows and family family apartments. The graduate rooms were in uh, the purple elements two and three, uh, with this one curving, uh, forming an east-west curved ridge uh, to, to enclose the view from the street. Entrances from ground level, landscape that filters its way through the site, and a model that we did quite early on just to show the simplicity of that. Massing. Um, and this is how it then emerged. And one of the things that you start seeing here if you're dialing to passive house standards is 450, 500 millimeter wall thicknesses, very heavily insulated. Uh, also, some protection there to windows facing due south or facing east west, um, self shading by the reveals, etc. Um, but simple. Simple staircases serving apartments each side, or staircases to the graduate rooms, which then then face um, then, then lead into groups of seven rooms and a common area. Uh, plans, plans of the graduate rooms, a model that we did just to show the balance really between the low carbon CLT sequestered energy in the internal structure and the higher carbon tile and brick on the outside of the building. And um, just again, designing to passive house, the thickness of the walls, just make sure, particularly for, for, your, for you students who are looking at this, start thinking um, more than the normal wall thicknesses that you would um, um, normally anticipate. And this is the CLT structure again that more than balances the uh, foundations, facade and roof and services in terms of embodied carbon. And in terms of passive house versus BRIAM, this is this was what we did in terms of looking at a BRIAM excellent version of this scheme. 
Um, with unregulated loads, that's the power loads that uh, people uh, people use that you can't specify. Um, the regulated load only, Brian excellent. Passive house, including unregulated loads, were down here. So again, just beware, Brian lead building regulations are going to get nowhere near the 2030 targets that you need to be going to. Just in terms of the character of the buildings, we are very much aware of this. If Cambridge, the Voisey buildings in Cambridge, the arts and crafts movement we attracted us. We also looked at 1930s buildings in Kings, um, these kind of gable structures and the collegiate forms. Uh, we were quite attracted to doing clever things with brickwork and tiles like uh, Monsieur de Clerc did in Amsterdam, and we're also aware of the, I mean, these are just the Cambridge character of brick, the um, the kind of uh, Cambridge stock bricks, this buff coloured brick, and also some of the very simple and curved geometries of the uh, Georgian buildings in Cambridge. So we also started thinking about these buildings, you know, when you bend a building, it has a sort of convex and concave character. If you imagine, you know, there's compression on one side and, and expansion on the other. And so we started looking at the way we might dealing with, deal with that in terms of a vertical inflection, horizontal inflection. And these are just sketches that Hugo Marek, my partner, did just looking at how we might stretch the building on one side and compress it on the other and how the architecture might develop to, to inform that. And this is how then it worked in terms of the scale of the buildings on the site. This is the elevation down Barton Road. And again, just to say um, we, we didn't have the carbon tool when we first started on this building, but we have done a, 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 an analysis of it using this carbon tool. And you can see there, the, the uh, this is looking at the embodied carbon. So the blue, all of the blue and purple here is all the substructure and uh, the, the superstructure is actually um, still has some em uh, embodied carbon within it, even though it's uh, no, so, sorry, that is just the that's the superstructure of the external walls and the internal. There is some internal blockwork walls. The um, yellow is the external walls and the uh, in, uh, sequestered carbon is is down here. This is the um, this is actually the CLT that is actually making it um, a, a carbon neutral building when it starts out. So here you are looking at the um, uh, electrical demand, and again we're looking at here the um, the black line shows us that we're not really doing desperately well on electrical demand. Though we're doing um, very well in in uh, we're almost within the sort of uh, RIBA 2030 challenge. This is 2020 and this is 2030. But the grey band here is if we installed photovoltaics on that east-west, on the east-west moves. So you can see that we are into 2030 targets there. And then this is looking at the um, uh, uh, both in operational energy, life cycle embodied energy with the superstructure giving us a huge kind of negative carbon emissions here um, and the uh, again the the operational uh, energy over the sorry the whole life energy over of the lifetime 100 year lifetime of the building but bear in mind that the below the line here is this the sequestered energy from the carbon so uh, again we're we're um, using that for, for the first sort of 50 years of this building, it will be a carbon negative building. So just some final shots of it's about it's just started on site. There's some uh, renderings of the um, brickwork and details, etc. The central space um, and the elevations onto Barton Road. Um, and part of our building, which is adjacent to this more decorative building that is owned by the college. So these three gables are ours. And then look, taking you into the site, curving away from the road. And then this is a view within the site, looking with the, the graduate rooms on the left hand side. And 
a snow scene in winter. So that's it. Thank you very much. Uh, I hope that's useful. Sorry, I've gone on a little bit too long. Happy to answer some questions. Anybody there? <laughs> Hi Peter. Hi, Peter. Uh, yes. Humphreys here. Thank, yes. You, Thank you, you very much for an amazing uh, presentation. And I think, anyway, starting off from where we uh, can speak to the, the Plymouth 2030 challenge in an academic environment and sort of with a group of students. One thing I think which is really interesting about the way you talked about the work is actually the project is not necessarily just a thing finished in itself. The idea of post occupancy, sort of, um, should we say, kind of re evaluation is really, really important. One, it would be really interesting to, if you could just sort of unpack in a sense that dialogue and that conversation that then happens as part of your practice in, in a sense, returning back to sort of client bases to begin to understand the work as, in a sense, a living thing. If you could just begin to sort of explain that, that would be really, really helpful. You're on mute, Peter. There we are. OK, can you hear me now? Yeah, OK, sorry. Um, so we always look to do um, post occupancy, occupancy evaluations of our buildings, but we we don't get to do them often enough. But we do have a, uh, a series of buildings where energy has been at the forefront of the design and so we have actually always um, gone back to check how the how the buildings are performing so when we did um, you know greenpeace headquarters we did the headquarters for the national trust in swindon we've monitored that three times we monitored it again after 12 years of operation and we not only do we look at energy performance but we look at we get uh, get the staff to do questionnaires, etc. So we're looking at the soft side of monitoring as well and how people respond to it. And, you know, do you feel drafty? Do you feel stuffy? Does this appeal? You know, are you happy with the building, etc. And and actually, it's uh, uh, the, the fine detail of a survey like that combined with the energy performance is really, really useful. Uh, I mean, National Trust building is very interesting, particularly because there's now 50 percent more people than it was designed to accommodate. But it's still a well liked building, which is quite remarkable. Really. People don't feel crowded out or anything. Um, they probably do now with COVID. But, um, uh, so, it, it, uh, we, uh, yes, to go back to your question, I mean, it, we, we, we always try to learn from our buildings. Quite often, if we're working for developers and the buildings are sold on, you don't really get to get that feedback. Um, but I think it is incredibly important. And one of the things, of course, that the RIBA has done now, as you probably know, is that you can only apply for RIBA awards now or from next year if you've got a year's worth of data of the performance of your building to accompany the award submission, which is a really good, very smart way of, um, of getting, uh, avoiding um, buildings that are energy profligate being put in for awards. Thank you for that. Thank you for that uh, sort of that answer there. And there are some questions which are coming up on the Q&A live chat. If people would like to sort of add questions there, that would be really, really helpful. We've got about 10 minutes to go. So I'll just read the questions out to you, uh, Peter, if that's OK. Yes, so sir. from John Watkins, what building anywhere in the world in the last part, in the past 10 years impresses you the most in terms of its sustainability credentials? Whoa, whoa. Um, that's an interesting one. So, uh, well, I, I'm afraid I haven't seen it yet, but I was delighted that Goldsmith, the Goldsmith Road project in Norwich won the Sterling Prize last year as a passive house, um, uh, local authority based project. Um, I hope that um, Paul from Plymouth knows about that project. I hope that lo every local authority should know about that project. We have to get back to local authorities sponsoring and producing their own really high quality precedent projects. 
Um, other buildings, I saw about five years ago an extraordinary building in Seattle which won a uh, Living Building Challenge Award. It was called the Bullet Center. Horrible name, but that's what I suppose I was going to say that's synonymous with American culture, but it's uh, it's spelled B-U-L-L-I-T-T. It's like the film. Um, and it's uh, it, it was um, an extraordinary timber frame building that ticked all the boxes of um, zero carbon and zero embodied energy, water, zero water use. It even had biological uh, decomposing toilets within it. You know, it was just, it was, a, a, if you really want an exemplar of sustainable design, look at that. I think it was by Perkins and Will. Um, oh, I don't know, John, that's putting me on the spot. I can't think of any others, uh, but we have had some really interesting projects, haven't we, recently? I mean, I tell you what, you know, Steve Tompkins, uh, another Sterling Prize winning project. Uh, he, you know, we've, uh, Steve and, and our practice have, have lots of really interesting theatre projects that, that use natural ventilation systems uh, rather than mechanical. And uh, Steve did one that is the best in, in, in Liverpool, the Everyman Theatre, which is a brilliant example of, of uh, regeneration of an existing building and and uh, low energy working to a very low energy low, low operational energy uh, uh, set of criteria. Uh, I think you're muted. Um. Probably time for a couple more questions. A slightly probably easier one. Uh, next, it's from Juan Oregon Student Member, University of Bath. Hi, Peter. Was it the architect's decision for the yellow paint on the exterior of the South Bank Centre? No, nothing to do with us. It was there before we uh, did our renovation. Um, and we didn't actually do any of, we didn't do any work to the exterior concrete. We left it all as it was, kind of warts and all. I think, it, I think that yellow paint dates from about 10 years ago when people were kind of doing, trying to do a bit of, livening up the building. Um, I think very quickly it kind of people felt, oh God, we've done the wrong thing here. Um, but you know, the fact is that it, it's a building that can take a bit of that abuse and not lose its character. So I don't regret it too much. Thank you. Uh, probably time just for two more questions. So firstly, and uh, there's one and I'll combine two together. Uh, this is from Matt Parks. Peter, you mentioned increasing uptake on the, of the RIGA 2030 Sustainability Outcomes metrics. Were there any challenges in getting clients to understand the value of this approach in terms of, sort of your practice? Um, well, we're finding, I mean, we have been quite lucky with our clients, I suppose. Um, and we, but we are, um, we, ha we are finding now that our developer clients um, you know, it's all it's all very well going working for King's College Cambridge with a, a, a quite a reasonable budget, uh, but when you're working for developers, um, we we are getting called in by developers to to say, look, what the hell do we do to meet these 2030 challenge targets? And they are aware of the uh, interestingly the Letty guide that I spoke about, which I'm really I consciously promote whenever I speak. That's it's it's uh, produced by a whole a load of young architects and engineers, cutting edge thinking, and basically it set a new set of standards alongside the RIBA 2030, which is. Um, and and it, it, it's it's a new sort of Bible in a way and. Um, and the developer development developer world is woken up to that and, and realized that actually they've got to move very quickly and Brian hasn't moved and lead hasn't moved and building regulations is stuck and in fact was going backwards until we until we told them they were going backwards and and um, you know so I think uh, we are sort of by default getting the 2030 challenge uh, coming to us from developers and the, there's an acceptance that we should we should work to those targets and as i said at the beginning and um you know they, they were produced very very quickly by the sustainable futures group at the riba 
but it would be really good to do the next set of work to develop a little bit a finer grain in terms of the building typologies and in terms of in terms of understanding the the metrics in more detail um, and, and learning from post occupancy evaluation. Wonderful. And we've just got a few minutes, so I'm going to combine two uh, sort of I think relevant similar questions together. The first is from Ajir. Peter, you started off the lecture by saying future architects need to understand the value of and focus on refurbishing of buildings. So one, do you imagine uh, in the near future there may be guidelines which are erring against new building new? And then leading on from that, actually sort of there's a question from Katie Watkins. Grim Grimshaw recently completed the retrofit and repurposing of the project of their Herman Miller factory in Bath, now Bath School of, Schools of Art. Is there a Field and Craig Bagley project that you would like to go back to and retrofit? Yeah, OK. <laughs> uh, well, I, uh, you know, I think all buildings can be retrofitted, can't they? It's interesting. Um, I, I'd like to retrofit my house that I did 25 years ago and figure out why I didn't make it better, a better level of air tightness. Um, and why I only put, you know, 200 millimetres of insulation in the roofs, you know, it's, it's kind of interesting, but we are, I am, um, I'm in the process, interestingly, of, of uh, retrofitting my house with a, a second set of, second range of photovoltaic cells plus an air salt heat pump, um, which is, you know, interesting that the and I, you know, we should know. You should all know that the government will help you do that. You know, and it's uh, it's 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 a sort of very sensible thing. If you know, within five years, we won't be able to have fossil fuels in our homes anyway. So, I mean, that's an example of a, a retrofit a retrofit that I am doing of one of my own buildings. I can't think that we have done any others. Uh, well, I suppose when we did one of my favourite projects, I suppose was the, was the recording studio that we did for about about 30, 30 years ago for Peter Gabriel, uh, which is still one of the best projects we ever done. And we have actually gone back and re renovated that a few times, um, changed the interiors, changed the acoustics, changed the you know inevitably if you can build in flexibility as uh, into buildings, uh, it's it gives you a huge amount of scope to do things. What was the other part of the question? I can't remember. It was Oh, sorry, you muted. Sorry. The other part of the question was in valuing, so that you started off by saying, in a sense, students, you know, future architects will be spending more time refurbishing. Do you see a time coming in the, in the near future where there may be guidelines on not yeah. new building? I think that is virtually already happening, to be honest. You know, I think certainly there is a moral duty to architects to assess the value of any existing building before you knock it down. And even if you're stripping back to structure and foundations, uh, you are saving, you know, 40, 50 percent of the embodied energy of that building. And so everybody is acknowledging that that is something working with the frame of an existing building and the foundations of an existing building is a really sound thing to do. And I think we will be looking at an embodied energy um, well, as as uh, we we uh, the carbon tool that we've developed does do that, it, you know, it kind of takes into account it, the existing embodied energy on site when there's an existing frame and existing floors, etc. So, um, I I I think that we shortly will have a kind of carbon budget for a building, which if you're talking about renovation, you'll be you'll be able to, you know, you'll have more. Uh, flexibility in terms of how you use that carbon budget if you're reusing an existing structure. And I, I mean, we are in the process of renovating some, we're, again, we're very lucky. We're doing an extraordinary series of buildings up in Leeds, working with uh, 1830s industrial buildings. Uh, we're doing something over in Ireland, again, looking at old mill buildings. And I think, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a really interesting challenge, uh, which uh, Follow, it sort of fits into the integrity of the architects declare challenge of reusing existing buildings and reusing and, and, and reducing embodied energy. Wonderful. If we've got time for just one last question, because there's just Go one last question come on the chat. 
and it's from Professor Robert Brown at the, from the University of Plymouth. You have witnessed tremendous change in practice, in practice in your career over the last 40 years. Given the scale and speed of change, where would you speculate we might be, and this is to, it's to students who are going to be in practice in the future, where we might be in another 40 years time? Oh my God. Oh God. That, so that's a, that's a whole new lecture, isn't it really? Um, no, I think, uh, well, yeah, the, the changes that I have seen, you know, I, I remember writing a thesis in 1972 or something about um, about renewable energy and photovoltaic cells were not mentioned, um, you know, and they've, they've gone from um, 30 cents from from 75, uh, $75 a, a kilowatt down to 25 cents a kilowatt. And, you know, so that huge, that is a huge transitional change that take the new technology. And if you look at LEDs in terms of the energy saving and, and you know, glazing technology, etc., massive changes. So what, what would, what's next? What's going to happen next? Um, I think it will be very interesting when we start getting rid of, of, of gas and oil in our buildings and what happens to the network of pipe work that connects our buildings. You know, there's an awful lot of people are saying, well, is that going to be replaced with hydrogen? Are we going to start making gas because we've got all that pipe work and we can distribute it? I I would have thought the sensible thing is that we should just uh, get rid of it all com completely. And I would have thought that we are moving towards uh, a, a regenerative design certainly means designing so that your the, the systems and the energy in your site can can fulfil the functions that you need on the site without bringing uh, bringing uh, uh, alternative without bringing mains energy in, you know, which is interestingly one of the first first things that I started doing in the late sixties at Cambridge, working on a project called the Autonomous House, where you know all of its servicing was created on the site. So I would look forward to that happening uh, more in the next in the next forty years. And um, I don't know, it's, it's, uh, the, everything's taken me by surprise. And as I said at the beginning, you know, Greta Thunberg took me by surprise. And uh, the, the, the whole em embodied energy issue took me by surprise. So I look forward to more surprises. Wonderful. Thank you very, very much, uh, Peter, for that. And I think we've now run out of time, but I think you'd all agree with me that this has been an absolutely fantastic annual lecture. Thank you very, very much. I would also like to thank sort of colleagues who introduced so, to Ajir, to Matt, and I, I endorse what Matt was saying about Sarah's contribution to setting this up in the first instance, and to Paul for introducing what has been an absolutely fantastic annual lecture. Thank you so much, Peter. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>